Hello and welcome to our uh, Bendigo IPTV attempt to uh, keep you up to date with what's happening in terms of the federal election and its likely outcome and impact on Bendigo. And uh, we're joined again today by Lisa Chester's federal member. Welcome, Lisa. It's great to be back on the program. That's great, Lisa, and great to have you here. Your poor thing, you're still trying to thaw <laughs> out because I've seen you myself over the road here handing out how to vote cards with postal voting and that. Um, what's, how's the vibe out there at the moment? What sort of vibe are you getting? Lots of people are still really keen to talk about what the different policies are. So uh, because it is a longer election, um, every part of an election has been dragged out. So we have three weeks of early voting. So we're almost at the halfway point of early voting. Um, so that's why sort of the red jacket is mm -hmm. on because it is the that's middle right. of winter. Uh, but what I'm finding when I'm sort of door knocking, when I'm talking to people on the phone and even in the street, uh, people are really engaging and wanting to know the differences with Labor's plan um, and what our plan specifically means for Bendigo and Central Victoria. So there's still lots of conversations to go between now and Election Day. Well, it's interesting that you're manning a polling booth now because when we were lucky enough to have uh, Senator Mitch Fifield in here this morning and one of the questions I asked him, obviously IPTV and him mm. Communications Minister, um, it was a great opportunity to explore some avenues there. but. One of the things I asked him was this. I said, uh, Senator, why or how would you explain the fact that in 2010 election, three million Australians who were entitled to vote failed to vote? And I'd be interested, Lisa, to know what you think, because you're talking to people every day, face to face. Why do we have that apathy? Why are people so cheesed off with the political climate in the country? I believe it's because Canberra's become quite exclusive. It is a bubble and um, politics these days has really become a game of gotcha. That's at least what's happening in some of the mainstream media. And that's one of the things that I really respect about our local media and programs like your program is they are longer interviews, they're in-depth interviews. You actually get to discuss and talk about policy, but also talk about the impact. It's not a 30 second sound bite. Mm. So I believe the fast pace of media um, in the metro media has really um, become quite exclusive and excluded a lot of people from the political discussion. Uh, when I talk to people in the street, they'll say to me, I'm not political, but if they've got a couple of kids, I'll say, well, what about your kid's school? Or they might want to talk to me about road funding or a road they've got problems with. Or they might want to talk about um, healthcare and I'll go, well, that's politics. It's governments that decide how much funding will go into that program or what um, healthcare policy we should have. So it's also about trying to help reconnect people with what the process is. I couldn't agree with you more, Lisa, that in my own case, and I know it's not really appropriate for me in this role to be expressing a view in a way, I'm mm. supposed to be asking you, <laughs> but in terms of just transparency being open, it frustrates me that there's this almost Collingwood Carlton mentality I see with Labor and Coalition, um, where, and I've heard people say, I don't care what they do, uh, I'll be voting X. Mm. Uh, and that's that's how it goes. Um, I just I get the sense that at the moment anyway, people tend to look at it in terms of the general population, say, well, a lot of the policies that are being talked about are being uh, said to be achievable or deliverable in eight or 10 or 15 years even. I mean, and they're not real. How do you feel about that sort of a, a, a change, I think, where we never used to have that? People used to talk about, we will in this term deliver that. But now they're talking about three terms down the track. And that, I think, is people just, um, politicians trying to lower expectations or trying to explain that it takes time to roll things out. Uh, some of our infrastructure will take time. Take the MBN, for example. Um, that is vital infrastructure and we are building it around the country. Now, Labor and Liberal have a very different policy when it comes to the NBN, but I think it's about being honest with people about these are the timelines. So it's not about we'll deliver in 2020. It's actually about, well, this is what we'll do in 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, because you're right, otherwise it's just future future expenditure that you're committing us to without any plan to really, what are we going to do between now and then? Um, what I, I do think we need to also do too is make sure we are being consistent throughout the term. So um, what's the funding source that's going to come from? So it's not just about a checkbook at election times. Well, where's the funding for that particular project coming from? And is that funding source really a priority for not just Bendigo, but for our country? 
Interesting you mentioned that funding uh, and the, the flow of revenue that obviously doesn't start and stop with election uh, timing. It runs ongoing and the NBN's a great example of that. Um, we asked Mitch Fifield mm. because he's looking after the, well, that's his portfolio at the moment, about the NBN in Bendigo. My argument, or my point to him, and you've heard Keith Sutherland say this as well, and he's probably hit you with it too, um, that Bendigo's been totally overlooked uh, and we've been bypassed uh, by mm. Shepherd and in particular in Ballarat. And his response was, yeah, well, it doesn't matter, we're doing the best we can, we'll have most of mm. this country online by 2020. Um, but at the same time, I guess from your point of view, he's saying, well, Labor's plan for the NBN will cost more anyway in Benigo and won't see as much uptake in the same time frame. W what would you say to that criticism? Um, look, you cannot trust Mitch Fifield at his word. Uh, since the Liberals have got elected and been in government, and it started with Malcolm Turnbull, um, Malcolm Turnbull stood up in Bendigo before the last election at a Bendigo Business Council and said that Bendigo businesses and premises and homes, the whole of Bendigo, would be connected to the NBN by the end of this year, their version. They said it would be faster, cheaper and sooner. Uh, and that hasn't happened. 97% of homes and businesses right now cannot connect to the NBN. And the only ones that can connect to the NBN, which are greenfield sites, new housing estates, mm. um, some fixed wireless tower sites, or some via satellite, all of those contracts were signed under the former Labor government. So none of this government's plan for the NBN has actually seen a new customer con connected. What we have is um, in Strathfield say they've got out to notify those homes that fibre to the node will be going in um, and that will be construction will start soon. Um, well, the whole of Bendigo is supposed to be connected to fibre to the node um, right now as I sit here today. The silver lining is though, because this government has been so slow to get on with their version of the NBN, uh, which is fibre to the node, not full fibre to the premises, um, there are MBN has not signed contracts for about half of Bendigo. So Labor has said, if we're successful on July 2nd, if we can form government, then where we don't have an existing MBN code contract for construction, we will sign a contract, um, we will commit um, those places to having fibre to the premises. So that's about 10,000 businesses and homes in the city of Greater Bendigo region. So that's a residential business mix then? That yes, yeah, absolutely. So the CBD will get fibre to the premises throughout the whole CBD because that is vital. Um, for areas Morong, the new business park they're talking at there, Morong, Aden Gully, Eagle Hawk, Epson, Huntley, um, just that ring, that sort of west and north, they will all get fibre to the premises because there's currently not a contract. But everywhere else, and unfortunately that includes where I live, mm. um, in Kennington and Strathfield say, where the contract's already been signed for fibre to the node, Labor's actually going to commission Infrastructure Australia to come up with a plan on how we can do a stage two build. Because ultimately fibre to the node is not fast enough it does not have the download and upload speeds we will need for the future. So Labor will actually go back and build a stage two to complete the job of fibre to the premises. You can see, Lisa, I mean, <laughs> and I'm in the game to some extent, I'm certainly not a techno whiz or an mm. IT man, but you mean doing what mm. we're doing here even, you need a, a level of knowledge. I've had to learn a hell of a lot in the last mm -hmm. two years. But you can see how confusing it must be for the average punter out there than the average voter, because Mitch yeah. Fifield's sitting there saying one thing, you're saying the yeah. other. We've had well, an example locally, and I love to stay local too, yourself and, uh, and Megan Purcell, both claim, are making uh, opposing claims around mm. the Mount Camel uh, outcome there. What's your take on that? Look, uh, because the I know towers, yeah. That, yeah the so towers. the towers were built in 2013. They uh, were actually built by the last uh, Labor government, but, then but they weren't switched in. on. Yes. Um, and that's because the relay tower Mount Camel um, was caught up in planning and it's been knocked on the head. Uh, the fact that NVN Co have now found an engineering solution for the other four towers because of that problem about the relay tower not being built, that is really a credit to the community who've actively gone out there and campaigned for it. I raised this issue in Parliament over 20 times in speeches that I made on the floor of Parliament. I had a meeting that was planned with Malcolm Turnbull. Um, he cancelled the meeting because the day before he became the Prime Minister. 
So oh, then I yeah. rang up the new Minister for Communications, Mitch Fifield, and tried to get a meeting with him. And I've written to Mitch Fifield and advocated to the Minister to intervene in this issue. It's taken us three years to get MBN to get to Co. That. to work out an engineering solution for these homes. Funny I mean, how it's happened now, right on election. Right on election, but in full credit to those communities. But even from an economic and business point mm. of view, could you imagine any other business mm. that could would have infrastructure left idle, not earning income? When it was sitting there anyway. It was just mm. You can see there. again why the average yeah. punter, I think, and again, coming back to uh, the, mm. the apathy, voter apathy, you can see, I think, why yeah. people do become frustrated. And, and it is up to the minister in that situation to intervene with MBN Co to say, why is this occurring? Like, there's a competency issue in question there. And my argument is, if it takes them three years to switch on four mobile phone, four, sorry, MBN towers, mm. how can you trust them to build the rest of the network? Well, and it's critical infrastructure that we need in the ground. So, Lisa, interesting, uh, we're talking voter apathy, we're talking, mm. then you've mentioned NBN mm. and, the, and your plan for Bendigo mm -hmm. to deliver to Bendigo an NBN connectivity that's you know, going to be fibre to the home uh, under a new contract. It's all money. And mm. an interesting online age report today survey says 80% of uh, respondents indicated that the affordability of things in the country and budget responsibility and control and debt, national debt, were the primary, was the primary thing that they mm -hmm. will take to the election. Do you see, look, the NBN approach you're yeah. going to take is going to cost more. Um, it, is that going to be an issue? It's not going to cost much more. And this is where Malcolm Turnbull has, has actually created quite a bit of a mess. Because the copper network is so degraded and because so much copper has to be replaced in the fibre to the node model, um, the cost of doing fibre to the premises is about the same as the cost of fibre to the node. And that's what Jason Clare, when he was in town last week, said that when it comes down to it, when you look at the final bill, because we have um, the MBN Co and the contractors have had to order so much more copper mm. to do fibre to the premises, it's actually going to work out the same. So this week, last week, for a lot of people in Greater Bendigo, their internet seeds, speeds have been really slow. Mm. That's because it's raining and rain and moisture in the ground, if you don't have um, properly covered um, line connections, affects internet speeds. I think we're all familiar we're with that. We're all, mm. exactly. So therefore, that is why um, we, you know, one of the benefits of replacing bad copper with fibre is you can take away that problem that you have when it rains. Mm. I mean, I, I see on Facebook people going, if you're still buffing, and mm. I'm like, I'm one of them. I'm still mm. buffing too. I know people's pain on this issue yeah. um, and it just it's where you need that leadership to actually say this is the infrastructure we need not just now but into the future I've said to Megan Purcell as well Lisa and I mean we know each other reasonably well I guess and I'll say to you in a selfish way I tend to look at this and I think regardless of whether you or Megan picks up this seat the best outcome for this electorate would be something less than a 1% swing. Now, I hate to say it, but I said the <laughs> same thing to her, I'm being honest. And I say that because I think what a wonderful time for electorates to put the hand up for those, whether they be infrastructure or, or policy areas that require funding uh, at election time. And the, poly, the parties, look what's happened. I think it's a stadium in Townsville is at $100 million mm -hmm. or something. Um, how do you feel about that, about that? And what are you going to be doing over the next two weeks to try and get you over the line? Mm. What are the key things you're out there going to do? Well, there's two parts to this story. First of all, Labor and myself, we've already committed a lot of projects to Bendigo. So $2 million towards the redevelopment of the Bendigo Tennis Centre. That's a great project that will see the redevelopment of that facility. Great facility, yeah. Uh, $1.7 million for the Bendigo RSL revitalisation project in Palmel. That's another local commitment that will see that project um, now have all of its um, funding partners in place. And then um, $400,000 for Sun Lung, our, you know, our much-loved mm. dragon, needs a bit of um, love and care. TLC, he's, yep. Yep, he's going to retire soon. And then there's some funding there to help purchase a new dragon. So there's some very local commitments that we've made. But what Labor has also done is looked at those big policy items which... Um, whilst when I say Medi um, Medicare, hospital funding, schools, 
what we've done is say, this is the big commitment for the country, but this is what it means for your community. So it's an extra $24 million for Bendigo and Central Victorian schools because we're going to back in the full Gons Gonski funding um, to make sure every school has the needs based funding it needs. Um, restoring the health and hospital agreement, um, that will see, you know, Bendigo Health lost $34 million because uh, the Liberals changed the funding formula. Well, we're going to restore the old one and put that funding back. Um, that's extra money for our new hospital, so it's got the resources and the finances to be able to open its doors on uh, day one. I've got to ask you this, Lisa, because Mitch Fifield, uh, in making not the same topic of comments, but comments in general, I had to ask him as well, and I interrupted mm -hmm. him too. And I asked him the question, are we living above our means, in a sense? Uh, because whilst the Coalition and Labor are both offering voters all these great things, can we afford them, given the scale of the national debt, or are we at a point where it really is a case of no matter which party you throw them what you can mm. to try and get in power, and then we'll worry about everything later? Well, what we've tried to do as well is say, and this is how we're going to fund it. So Labor's come out and made some decisions that have upset business, for example. So we have said that Labor will not proceed with the um, tax cut for big business. Uh, and that over 10 years will cost the budget, that tax cut measure alone, $50 billion. So we have said that rather than give big business a tax cut, we want to see that money invested in health and invested in education and invested in infrastructure like the MBN and a number of other projects that we've announced. So in acknowledging how do you get the budget back to being um, surplus, surplus or balanced. Mm. Well, we it comes back to priorities. And what Labor is saying is we prioritise right now at this time, given the economic climate, given the inequality that we're facing in our communities, we need to go back to um, funding health, education, supporting um, businesses to grow, but not giving big business and multinationals those tax cuts because we don't believe that that will actually benefit the broader community in the way that the government is cla claiming. So we've we've actually gone out there to try and say, well, this is our plan for budget repair um, that we believe is fair. So for the very first time in quite a few elections, there's a clear difference between Labor and Liberal. And we're saying what we will not proceed with and we're saying where that funding will go because you're right, there's X amount of revenue and Labor is saying, well, this is how we're going to generate more revenue. This is the revenue pie we've got. And then this is how we plan to spend that funding when we're in government. Lisa, you've been uh, very loyal to us throughout your time so mm. far in Parliament uh, and very open to uh, these sorts of interviews. And as you said at the outset, it's, it's a nice change to be able to hear the whole story rather than an eight second grab in a news story. So. So thank you so much for taking the time out today. When you, I've got you out of the rain anyway, away from the polling booth for a while. Yeah. Good luck for the next two thank weeks. You. And as I said, I'm I'm biased in one way, but I'm biased in favour of Bendigo. Yeah. I hope we get a narrow margin, and a great quality candidate representing us as we have now in you. Mm. No matter who that is, I just want to, uh, what's right for Bendigo. So all the very best if we don't catch you before then. And thanks so much again for taking the time today. Great. Thanks a lot for having me on the program, Dennis. No worries. And we'll have Keith, uh, Keith Sutherland back shortly, so uh, you won't have to put up with me uh, all the way through this election campaign, hopefully. But uh, we will tr do our best, uh, as always, to keep you up to date with what our local candidates are offering and what, who's coming to Benigo and what might lie ahead for our electorate. Thanks for joining us today and we'll see you again next week.